Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. You know, we are we are taking a we take great pride in our Sunday night uh, lecture program. You know, everyone may uh, be dispersed or isolated or confined, but uh, thank God that we've discovered a way to to reach the the wide audience of the Fifth Avenue Synagogue. And uh, we're proud of this uh, diverse program we put together. There are Torah lectures, uh, there are doctors, there are sports team owners. And tonight uh, we have a chance to get a little bit of a glimpse into the world of culture and, and Jewish history with a very unique uh, presentation. And we'd like to call upon uh, Esther Goldman, a dear member of the Fifth Avenue Synagogue, who is a lecturer at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Uh, who helped uh, coordinate and arrange this evening's program and could give a, a proper formal introduction of this evening's uh, presentation. Thank you, Rabbi. This is, I must say, I'm very uh, pleased to be able to do this and to thank Barbara already for what's going to be a very uh, interesting, stimulating uh, lecture. But I just want to talk a little bit about um, what, in a sense, has happened in the, in the last few months uh, with COVID. Uh, obviously, the museums have been closed and a lot of other institutions have been closed. And we have to realize how important the museum is in the life of the, uh, of the city, of the culture, of the nation, of the people. Um, it, it really gives us a sense of our past and of our present and maybe of our future. Um, it is a very enriching thing and it's a, it's a very important part of our lives. And here in the city, we're very fortunate because we have world-class institutions, obviously the Metropolitan Museum of Art uh, and uh, the Cloisters. And I hope that everyone has been up to the Cloisters. And if you haven't, uh, you certainly, when you should be able to. Um, it's propitious that this Barbara's speaking today because the Met has just opened. So uh, people can, uh, can go back there. You have to, you know, check on all the requirements. Uh, the Cloisters won't be open for another two weeks. Um, but the Cloisters is a very, very special place. And for those people who are not familiar with it, um, it's a, in a way, it's a sanctuary. It's a very quiet um, place with wonderful gardens. And if you go up there just to see the gardens, that's, that's uh, uh, must speak, uh, it's, it's, it's a very good experience to be able to do that. And so uh, relating to that is, uh, of course, our speaker, who is a curator at the, at the Cloisters. And I have to say, Barbara and I really know us, uh, know each other for many years. I, I don't want to say how many years, right, Barbara? <laughs> um, but uh, I was a student at Columbia in, uh, in the Graduate School of uh, Arts and Sciences, and Barbara came from the Institute of Fine Arts. And at Columbia, we had a visiting professor who came uh, for a number of years, a very famous uh, uh, historian, art historian of Carolingian art, and uh, Barbara came and uh, took a class uh, uh, there. So that we, we, we go back that, that far. Um, and uh, Barbara uh, started out, she got an MA from Wellesley, PhD from the Institute of Fine Arts, and she did all this where she was working as a secretary in the medieval department. Uh, she has a certificate in Jewish art from JTS, and uh, she is the only present-day American curator to be elected to the Société Nationale des Antiquités de France. That's a great honor. Um, and uh, she's been involved in a number of different Jewish uh, exhibitions, or exhibitions of, of Jewish objects, I should say. Uh, the 2005 Prague exhibit, the exhibit of the Washington Haggadah, the Ryland's Haggadah and the Lisbon's uh, Hebrew Bible, which is considered a national treasure uh, in, in Portugal. And of course, very much involved in the uh, very large uh, Jerusalem exhibition. And uh, I have to add also, she was involved with, uh, with JTS and she took the course there. And uh, we very frequently at the Cloisters have Hebrew manuscripts. Uh, right now it's the Prado Haggadah, so when people can go, uh, can go up there, uh, I would suggest you go to see that. Uh, and uh, really this Colmar exhibition, uh, which of course was the last, ex the ver last special exhibition at the Cloisters, I would say it was very relevant, relevant for a number of reasons. <laughs> and at the time, I don't think when she uh, organized it, realized that uh, we would have our own plague here because of course that's part of the reasons for that particular exhibition. And it really came about because of the relationship between the Cloisters and the Cluny Museum in, in France, in Paris. And also uh, with Barbara's uh, friendship with the director uh, who was recently retired from the Cluny. So Barbara, I, I give it over to you. 
Thank you, Esther, and thank you, Rabbi, um, for inviting me to, to join your congregation for an evening. Uh, it's, a, it's really a special privilege for me. Um, I, uh, I'm very fond of the fact that Esther and I have been friends for so long, so to be amongst some of her friends is a special thing. Um, I'm going to share my screen so we can get started talking about the works of art that we want to be looking at tonight. So bear with me a second. There we go. So this is the, uh, this is the exhibition, the, the last exhibition that I did for the Cloisters. Uh, it's, so truth be told, it's one of the smaller exhibition projects I've ever worked on. Uh, most, almost all the objects came from a single lender, so it wasn't terribly complicated in that regard. There weren't so many objects, they all fit into one gallery at the Cloisters, not one of the great sprawling exhibitions such as I've done in the main building. Um, and yet, as, as modest as it is in scale, um, and as easy in a sense as it was relative to other Met projects that I've done, I have to say that I'm so proud of having done this exhibition. I really think that it, um, it did something very special for, uh, for our audience and for our institution. So, so why do I say that? Um, this is a view of the inside, interior garden at the Cloisters. This is the Judy Black Garden at the Cloisters. I was struck that Esther immediately mentioned the issue of the cloisters as a sanctuary, and people do find it that uh, to be that, uh, as does the staff. Sometimes we don't even realize how much people uh, avail themselves of this space as a place of sanctuary, and that was brought home to me uh, not long after I went to work at the cloisters. I used to work in the main building at Fifth Avenue. And I went up to the Cloisters in 2008. And a gentleman left us a significant amount of money in his will. We didn't know anything about him. He hadn't been on the radar for the development office. But at some point he had contracted a mortal illness that he was aware of. And he had X number of months to live. And he came every day, apparently, to the Cloisters and sat in the gardens in the afternoon. And he instructed his wife uh, that a substantial contribution should come to the Cloisters after his death, which was an extra, just an extraordinary thing to, to realize the impact that uh, a place like the Cloisters and its works of art can have on people. That said, I, I think that the Cloisters can also be a very intimidating place from the outside. So if you, if you look at this image, it screams church, cathedral, monastery, castle, uh, fortress. It doesn't feel particularly welcoming from the outside if you're not from a Christian tradition, if you're not from a European tradition, if you're unfamiliar with that architecture. Because the architecture is kind of foreboding. And it's aggravated, to my mind, by those dreadful red banners hanging out front, which I have complained about repeatedly. Because to me, they evoke Germany in the 1930s, and that's totally not the look we want to be going for. And when I mentioned that, interestingly, to some of the young members of the design team who had come up with these bright banners, they had no idea what I was talking about. Absolutely no context that a red, thin red hanging banner could have any kind of negative associations. So, Part of my work since I've been at the Cloisters is to try to give a broader picture, a more accurate picture of what does medieval Europe represent. And in, it is in that regard that I've begun uh, with my colleagues to try to reinforce the role of Jewish cultural and artistic heritage in the history of medieval Europe. And I'm very proud to say that this extraordinary Hebrew Bible made in Spain in the 14th century was something that we were able to purchase for the Cloisters in 2018. Um, the Cloisters and the Met generally does not have a huge collection of manuscripts. 
we have what I would call signature manuscripts representing key moments in the history of medieval art. So we have the Belles Heures of Jean de Berry, right? And we have a Cloisters Apocalypse from the beginning of the 14th century. And we had not so long ago acquired a Carolingian Bible. So with only a handful of really strong manuscripts, to be able to put a Hebrew Bible, a beautifully decorated um, Hebrew Bible in that special selection uh, was very significant, uh, a very significant step. So that was the same idea that I had in bringing the Colmar treasure to the cloisters, was to try to reinsert uh, in people's understandings of medieval Europe, to reinsert the presence of Jewish culture and art. And so that is why the Colmar treasure came to us. And please note the subtitle, right? A Medieval Jewish Legacy. The original title I wanted to give to this exhibition was Lost and Found. Um, but just, I think just the year before this exhibition came, there was an exhibition, I think, at the Yeshiva University Museum with that title. So that uh, I needed to find something else. And in the end, I'm really glad that I landed on this because I think the notion of legacy is absolutely crucial to um, communicating what, what I was trying to do, what we were trying to do institutionally in presenting this exhibition. Most of our reviews were very favorable. People understood what we were up to. Um, and there were two exceptions. One was a letter that I received from a doctor who lives on Park Avenue, who wrote me a letter and said, treasure, what treasure? These look like tchotchkes to me. Well, that was a little, de after I finished laughing, it, it was a little depressing that he saw it that way. Um, but then a reviewer said, anyone anticipating spectacular unveilings is bound to be disappointed. And so it got me thinking, well, what was it that they were, that these people were looking for? What was it? What is the popular expectation of a treasure? And is, is it fair to define the Colmar treasure as a treasure compared to what people expect? And so on reflecting on that is what I want to do first with you. I want to reflect on what popular notions are tre of treasures and then get to why I think a Colmar treasure belongs perhaps more than some of these other treasures with, to be understood as treasure with a capital T. In general, anything that has gold in it, people understand as a treasure. Lots of gold coins, right away, people think that's a treasure, right? It's a blingy thing. It's a sense of wealth. It's spendable. It's meltdownable. It has an inherent monetary value. And yet, when you look at two treasures side by side, and these are two different treasures, they kind of blur, don't they? They're not works of art necessarily. A numismatist would have a fit about what I just said, because they see the art of making coins. And it's true. Coins can be beautiful and impeccably worked, but sometimes they're not. And for most people in their understanding of a coin treasure, it's about the monetary value associated with it. And it doesn't matter to most people where they're from or how many there are. It's the weight of the gold, it's the glimmer, it's that. So people understand gold to be treasure whether it's beautifully worked or not. Now, if you can add to the notion of gold, the fact that it was found underwater, well, then you know you have a treasure, right? And you get this right from childhood. Did any of your children have this in their aquariums? It was a little pirate's chest and it was on, was on a kind of battery or plugged in and it would open and inside it would be these fake gold coins, right? So right from the time that kids are little, they understand the notion that treasure can be under the sea. Right? 
I don't know if any of you saw just in the last week, there were several reports about a new treasure that was excavated in Israel, right? Gold coins from the Arab period and a couple of Byzantine ones thrown in the midst that were found over the course of the summer by some of these uh, volunteer archeologists who go to work with the uh, Israeli ar uh, archeologists firm um, authority and from time to time reveal extraordinary things, things of, and of course the great thing when you find a gold treasure, because gold is impervious to uh, the elements, is that it's beautifully preserved, right? So when you have a treasure that's gold or you have a treasure that's underwater, then you know, there's no question in people's mind, that's treasure with a capital T. Well, if you can also link that treasure to some kind of romantic or tragic tale, then that further enhances the sense that people have that this really matters as a treasure. And I'm sure you all realize that what I'm showing you is the part of the hull of the Titanic, right? And do you remember when that was, when people first got down to where the Titanic was? X number of the depth under the Atlantic Ocean and realized it was there how sort of mysterious that was and how much press that got and then how things began to emerge that had been part of the titanic treasure and so on the right hand side you see this very elegant and lavishly decorated and beautifully worked diamond ring from that treasure titanic which sank in april of 1912. now if you can add to the sense of a tragedy something that is either illicit or illegal about the taking of a treasure, that's another aspect that people will immediately recognize, oh, this was a treasure. And whether, whether you are the victim of the taking of that treasure or the looters who are celebrating the treasure, everybody gets it that this was a momentous occasion, right? So this is on the Arch of Titus in Rome from the sacking of the temple in Jerusalem in 70. And what appears bigger than anything, the great temple menorah. So that if you are seeing this sculpture, relief sculpture from the ground, from a distance, you know right away what it is proclaiming about the capture of these great treasures. And no one would have the slightest doubt that this was a, an occasion that becomes a historical moment that is really indelibly etched in people's minds. And if you can add the kind of realm of fantasy to the whole event, as you might with the Golden Ark of the Covenant in the Indiana Jones movies, well, then there's that air of mystery and the, and, uh, and the romantic that all goes together on this question of something that might make you invincible. And uh, it becomes a, um, really something that enters into popular imagination, whether it's pure fantasy or whether it's actually true, right? And the extraordinary treasure found with the opening of the tomb of King Tutankhamun in 1922, right? And with um, Howard Carter proclaiming, I see wondrous things and all the gold and the glimmer and this vast uh, assemblage of precious objects. And again, the, there's the kind of tragedy, right? The boy king, the boy, the king who dry, dies too young. So if you think about all of those amazing treasures was our critic right in saying well anybody who's showing up looking for something spectacular here is bound to be disappointed well maybe maybe how does the colmar treasure stack up to those preconceived notions those definitions that we have in our heads when we're asked to look at something, when we make a trip to the cloisters to see something that's been labeled a treasure. Well, we do have the notion of the windfall, the unexpected find. Now, I don't know how many of you have been to or know Colmar. Colmar is a city maybe half an hour by train at the most, maybe 20 minutes south of Strasbourg, which is, a, a, of course, the great larger city uh, in Alsace. And it's known today for its very quaint streets. Um, it's preserved 
late medieval Renaissance town, its beautiful churches, um, the great Isenheim altarpiece, which people will make a trip to see. And even if you talk to residents of Colmar, as, as I did while I was there for a number of days, not, not my colleagues in museums or libraries, but people in restaurants or people in the hotel. Oh, why are you here? I'm here on business. What kind of business? I'm interested in the Colmar treasure. What's the Colmar treasure? They didn't know. And I found this absolutely extraordinary. And when I went to the street where the Colmar treasure was found, which you see in these two images, well, there's nobody there. And there's nobody, there's no sign. There's nothing to uh, mark its location. That, you see where it says Le Rap Hotel, and then these kind of um, uh, leaded glass windows in front of the restaurant of the hotel. That's the building in which the treasure was found. The treasure was found in the 1860s while workmen were doing, in May 1863, while workmen were renovating the building. It was not a hotel at that time. Uh, and it's a, a building that goes from that green building over to the pink building to the corner. Um, and it's on what was the Rue des Juifs, the Jews street in Colmar, at the corner of that and the Rue Weinemar. Now I should say right away that the Rue des Juifs in the medieval period and subsequently was a street where many Jews lived, but not uniquely Jews. And many of the more aristocratic families in Colmar lived on that street as well. Funnily enough, the streets that we think of in Colmar as being the kind of quintessential medieval Renaissance charm streets, and I'm sorry, I should have perhaps also had an image of those, these kind of half timbered houses, are the less expensive houses in town at the time. The, the uh, more expensive houses are farther from the river, and this is farther from the river, and uh, were stone facades. The half timbered buildings close to the river, well, the river was where the trade was, so it was A, noisier, B, smellier, and the half timbered buildings were uh, less expensive to build and more likely to burn down. So this was from uh, a neighborhood where uh, there was um, a certain uh, economic level, a certain elevated economic level. Um, and we do not know who lived at that address in the 14th century, which as we'll come to see was the date when uh, the, the objects in the treasure were made. Okay, so what was this shop and why, why uh, what was this building and why were they renovating? It was a confectioner's shop in the mid 19th, sex, sense, uh, mid -19th century. It was shall we say, the la durée of its day. I know you all know about la durée, so that's a good point of comparison. And these were shops that um, were rather upscale shops, uh, especially in this case, because the de Mongeau family, which uh, ran the confectionery, they didn't specialize in the pastries so much. They made the liqueur from pear and apple. Um, and so that's why you see a bottle of poire on the, on the left-hand screen, to give you a sense of who these people were. So the Dimoncio people were renovating the building, or having it renovated, so that they could um, expand their business. And workmen on the site in May of 1863 came upon this cache of objects in the wall of the building. Now, this was not an archaeological dig. There was no immediate report. The circumstances are a little bit murky. And the workmen didn't necessarily mention it right away. These weren't pirates, but they also weren't, um, shall we say, um, excavators working on the completely on the up and up. It, two decades would pass before there was any kind of written reference to the treasure that was found. Okay, so what did they find? And Ultimately, they reported to Monsieur de Mongeau, the owner of the property. Well, the first thing that they found was coins. But let's look at these coins compared to the ones that I just showed you a minute ago. And right away, I'm sure you see a difference. There's only one gold coin here. The rest of them are silver, and some of them are proper coins, those larger ones at the top, and some of them are what are known as ractiate. They were stamped on one side, they're very thin, they're almost floaters, right? 
<laughs> Remember when you used to sometimes, in some European currencies, you would get those little coins and you might drop them in a fountain, but they wouldn't even sink, they would float. Well, that's probably what some of these are. Um, but, but what do they tell us? They actually tell us quite a lot. And these coins are not great works of art, but we know where they were made. And we see that they relate to communities up and down the Rhine River and over towards Switzerland and back into France and over towards Prague, right? So there's, this is a not a town that is sitting in an isolated way. That hoard you see on the left is the hoard of coins that I borrowed or part of the hoard of coins that I borrowed for the Jerusalem exhibition that you came upon smack dab as you walked into the exhibition. Those were ones that were found off the coast of the Mediterranean, just off the, uh, I can't remember exactly what the fine spot was, come to me later, um, but shortly before we did the Jerusalem show. So again, the modesty of these 300 coins from Colmar against those 3,000 coins that were found um, off the coast of Israel not very long ago. What else do we have? We have rings. But look at the rings that we have. You see three garnets and one funny white stone. But let's look at the garnets. Very thin bands, not a lot of metal. Now, that said, the gold band is beautifully worked. Do you see the, the bezel, the mount on the gold? is very fine in both cases. And the one on the left is gilded silver. The one at the top, very simple silver. These are not expensive rings. This, these are not the diamonds of the uh, Titanic treasure that we looked at before. And the one at the right is something called a toadstone, and we'll come back to that. Yes, there are some gemstones in the group. A sapphire at the left and an emerald in the middle. But nobody has asked me over the course of the exhibition, and I'm sure no one asked Esther when she took people around the exhibition, what's the carat weight of those stones? That's not what this is about. Right? This is about the rarity, first of all, the rarity of 14th century goldsmith's work. There is nothing that changes fat more quickly. Well, I was, I was gonna say then fashion and jewelry, but I would say pediatric fashion. <laughs> Whether you're told to put your child uh, down for a nap on his tummy or his back. That changed between my children, four and six years apart. Jewelry fashion changes very quickly too. And you all know that. How many of you have a ring that belonged to your grandmother that maybe your daughter would like, but she really only wants it if she changes the setting? This has been true for centuries. And so when uh, medieval rings survive, it's usually because they were hidden. Uh, and nobody had the chance to decide to melt down that little bit of gold, take out that one sapphire and put it with the emerald into a new ring. So there's that aspect. And then there's the toadstone. This is a funny thing. There was a belief in the Middle Ages that this stone, which is actually a fossilized fish bone, fish teeth actually, um, came from the head of a toad. And you see in the woodcut on the left, a man ostensibly removing such a growth from the head of the toad. And this was a kind of all purpose magic. So if you had a ring made of toadstone, it could protect you from all kinds of things, all kinds of illnesses, against poison. And so it was, very, it was a very useful thing, right? So now suddenly we do have something of that aspect of mystery that we talked about in definition of a treasure. And we see that even more with this ring. This ring really baffled me when I started to work on this project because it's onyx. And onyx is exceedingly rare in the Middle Ages. And I had trouble, of course, maybe it's because they don't survive, but I had trouble finding any references to onyx as well. I couldn't find them in descriptions of people's wills, whether they were tradesmen, whether they were merchant class, whether they were princes, I couldn't find them. And then I was reading uh, an English translation of a lapidary, so a discussion of stones, written in Hebrew in 1290. It was a translation of a Latin text, but used 
um, by jewelers and uh, stone specialists whose la first language was Hebrew or whose reading language was Hebrew. And it said the following about onyx. If you have a relative or a friend who has died and you're feeling really bereft and you want to communicate with that person, what you should do is put an onyx ring on your finger before you go to bed. And then you will dream of that person and you will carry on a conversation in your sleep with your friend who's lost. And I kind of think that's what's going, I'd like to think that's what's going on here. Why? Two reasons. First of all, if you notice right next to the onyx, you see those clasped hands? That's an ancient thing. We might think of them today around Irish uh, love rings where there's two hands on either side of a heart. But the practice of putting intertwined hands on rings is an ancient one and it's very prevalent in the medieval period and you see it here. And if you were able to see the back of that ring, it has an inscription in Latin and it says, Audi Vidi, I heard and I saw. And I can't help thinking that that's a connection to this notion that by wearing this onyx ring, you can somehow be in touch with someone very special to you who's lost. So there is that sense of magic in this hoard. We talked about the sense of tragedy and how when there's a tragic story, things associated with that tragedy become precious, become part of a treasure. What I'm showing you is simply a biscuit, but it happens to be a biscuit from one of the rescue boats, one of the lifeboats of the Titanic. And can I tell you that that biscuit was auctioned in London on the 24th of October of 2015 for 15,000 pounds a biscuit. So people's understanding of treasure and of the, of the way that tragedy makes something precious, something that has survived a tragedy becomes precious. I can't think of a better example than this simple stale biscuit, right? Well, yes, that applies to our Colmar treasure. And when the Colmar treasure has been shown before, which has been uh, not for an, an, a decade or so, but each time it was shown before, it was entitled, and may I say marketed, because of the context of the Black Death. And so there we have it the exhibition catalog from when it was shown at the Musée de Cluny and when it was shown in London as treasures of the Black Death. The swirling waters of the Atlantic pale, the sinking of the Titanic, pale next to the tragedy associated with the bubonic plague in Europe. And you all know that story. And I imagine that you know that story specifically as it affected the Jewish community of Europe not everywhere in Europe, but especially many places and especially along the Rhine, where in this toxic brew of panic, the townspeople in these various communities, many of whom had worked side by side with their Jewish neighbors for a hundred years, especially in the wine industry, turned on their neighbors and burned them because they blamed them for the plague, believing that somehow they had poisoned the water. This was not the position of the church. This was not the position of the Pope who spoke up against it, but this was the, this was the insanity of the masses. And it of course drew on longstanding misunderstanding and otherness and hatred of the, on the part of the Christians towards their Jewish neighbors. This is how the exhibition, though, was presented to the public. To me, the very nature of calling it treasures of the Black Death perverts the notion of treasure. Just to give it a perspective, imagine, this is what I said last year when I would talk about this, imagine having an exhibition called 
treasures of the AIDS virus or the Ebola or treasures of COVID-19. It takes the personal and turns it over to the disaster. 60 to 70 individuals in Colmar lost their lives in 1349 because of the hatred and the fear that was created at the time of the Black Death. We don't even know the exact date. We know it was after December 27th because there was an attestation on part of one member of the public uh, about this. And we know it was before April 2nd because in April 2nd, the Holy Roman Emperor sent his deputy to Colmar to see what the circumstances were. And that was a perverse thing too because the emperor ostensibly protected the Jewish communities in his territories, in the Holy Roman Empire. And that's why many Jewish people had come into the Holy Roman Empire in the late 13th, in the beginning of the 14th century, especially those who were expelled from the kingdom of France. And they were protected ostensibly by the emperor. But his protection uh, was um, to his benefit to his economic benefit. And he was just as ready to turn on them. Uh, and he looked the other way when these atrocities were taking place. And then after they'd taken place, he showed up to take his share of the property that was left behind. There is a, this is not an isolated incident. There's a treasure, another treasure of this type, treasure of the Black Death. Uh, from a place called Weissenfels, uh, a little farther inland, uh, deeper into German, what, what is present day Germany than the um, Alsace, the French, along the French German border, where Colmar lies in France, by the way, since the 1600s, except for two brief periods. And I've circled there um, on the screen the uh, wedding ring that is in that treasure which is like the wedding ring in the Colmar treasure on a more modest scale. So what are these wedding rings? These are wedding rings, uh, there's only a handful that survive, that were used in the wedding ceremony, not to wear as your wedding ring, but to be used in the ceremony that represented, you can see, I, I, I imagine you can see that they say basel, that this one says basel top on it. Um, and they were, they were there as reminder of the temple. And the notion was, as I understand it, that in the absence of the temple itself in Jerusalem, that your, your home, the home that you were establishing when you married, became a kind of temple. Um, and these are extraordinarily beautiful rings, especially the one from the Colmar treasure, which you see has beautiful red enamel, and then alternating panels that you see now just as gold, which were originally enameled green. Green enamel is extremely fugitive um, and has uh, has broken off except for little tiny microscopic bits. There, um, interestingly, the ring that's from Weissenfels was almost overlooked in the early publications. They, they, they didn't quite realize what it was. Uh, eventually they picked up on it and realized that it had a Hebrew inscription. From the same time is this other treasure. She consists almost uniquely of coins, 28,000 silver coins found in Salzburg, again on the Jews street, um, in Salzburg with bits of belts and clasps. So something, again, where it's purely monetary value that has been set aside because of the, um, the uh, value inherent in the metal itself. Now that treasure actually dates a little bit earlier, not specifically from the Black Death period. Now this treasure, uh, which you may well know, it's become rather famous since it was found in 1988 in Erfurt. Uh, in what used to be East Germany. And you can see that there are, um, that, that its contents are um, similar in some ways to the Colmar treasure. You see some rings, you see some belts, you see some silver coins. Um, to me, this is kind of like the wealthy sister uh, compared to Colmar. And it's gotten a lot more press than the Colmar treasure. I think no question that part of that reason is simply that, it, that there's more to it. It's, it's a wealthier, 
poured. Um, those at the back, you see those things that look kind of like silver uh, discs or do you remember Mrs. Wagner pies? That's what <laughs> they're like silver Mrs. Wagner pies at the back. Those are actually ingots, big silver ingots. And at this time in the 14th century, you could actually still use ingots in the marketplace. They could weigh them and you could use them to make purchases. Uh, this may have belonged, the thinking is that perhaps this represented the wealth uh, of the community, the Jewish community itself, because it was found all, really cheek by jowl with the synagogue itself. I, I'm not sure that's true. Uh, I think it could be the property of a very wealthy merchant, but we don't really know. Then this is a cup from the, our Colmar treasure. You see in Erfurt those, that, those cups, and the same thing from the Colmar treasure. And the same thing from the cloisters. Ours at the cloisters is bigger than the one from Colmar. We don't know where the cloisters one comes from or under what circumstances it was excavated. And then there's this treasure. Again, you see that kind of signature um, double cup. The Jewish communities love these double cups. They seem to have used them. Um, we see them in manuscript illuminations being used at seders and other kinds of um, ceremonies. Uh, but they weren't uniquely for Jewish use, um, but they seem to have been uh, rather preferred. This treasure uh, is the Lincolnfeld treasure found in 1969, and it has always been, because uh, the coins date from 1349, it's always been assumed that it might be, uh, that it would also be such a Jewish, you know, a treasure that had been hidden by Jews who were persecuted, but there's nothing in this treasure that's specifically Jewish, and, and so it's not impossible that it represents the treasure, the holdings of, uh, uh, of some, someone not necessarily Jewish who perished during the Black Death, which of course uh, reduced the population of Europe by something like a third. Uh, I want to draw your attention. You see lying flat there at the right hand side, uh, a, a funny thing, that's a letter E. That's going to be important to us when we keep, as we keep talking about the treasure from Colmar. And then this treasure, which was found in Silesia in present day Poland, right? In a place called Sroda Slaska. Uh, and this, I think, uh, almost certainly represents um, Bohemian royal treasure that was put into pawn, um, probably uh, for one of the Jewish merchants with which the uh, emperor did business. Uh, you can see right away that higher level of this, of the workmanship here, some really serious sapphires and some very serious goldsmiths work. And this probably also uh, was buried uh, around the tri same time. So, so where does that leave, leave us with the Colmar treasure? I think, first of all, we are in a place where we have, in this, we have first to begin with acknowledging the tragedy that lies behind this treasure. That's our first job. But I think it is also incumbent upon us to press beyond that. Because if we stop at the Black Death, then we are left with the Black Death and faceless victims. People that we can't quite imagine. And to me, that isn't where we ought to be if we are trying to get at the role that these people played in medieval society. It was important to me to get at hints, to look for hints of the personal in this treasure. And that's something that hasn't really been done before. I'm very lucky because people who worked on this treasure before me looked at the way the gems were mounted and said, oh, that ring is a 13th century mound mount or oh that ring is a 14th century mount and oh those coins are from 1290 and those coins are from 1320 that work had already been done but they hadn't then stepped back and said what does this tell me and it's easy if you start with this picture from just around the time the cord this treasure was acquired by the musée de cluny and do you see that i've put red circles around two letters a letter a at the left and a letter r might look like a B, but it's an R, I think. Um, and those hint at something personal. Remember, we saw an E before in that Lingenfeld treasure. But now we're seeing two letters. Those letters, sadly, were lost after the time this material was already acquired by the Cluny Museum. 
But to me, those are hints of something personal. Now at the left, I'm back to the Titanic. That's a bracelet that says Amy on it. That was another thing from the Titanic that was sold at auction. And I'm sorry I didn't hold on to how much that obtained. But do you see right away when you could read that name, there's something you've crossed over just the statistics and the event and you've approached a person. Well, on the right is a very modest piece from a belt that's part of the Colmar treasure. And there are a number of these belt elements and some of them say amor, Latin for love. And the, some of the words are in French and some of them are in Old German and some of them are in Latin. And this one says A-M-C-H. And my colleague at the Musée de Cluny said, huh, I wonder, is that like a medieval German nickname for Annie? Is that what it really says? Does it really say Annie? Is that a personalization of this belt? And if you then think about the letter A that was part of this treasure, have we gotten somehow closer to who is behind? Whose treasure was this? Who did we lose, right? This is kind of a ratty looking headband in the treasure, but I love it for a couple of reasons. This is a kind of headband that was worn this way, right? For anybody who remembers the 60s, this was kind of a hippie look, right? You would wear a headband going around this way. Or remember when the Princess of Wales, Diana, Princess of Wales, took a, uh, a, one of the tiaras and put it around her head this, this way. That was a big fashion in the mid 14th century. And you see that original silk that held all these little elements together is kind of falling apart. <clears throat> but if I, when I looked, to try to find things related to it. Yes, you can see in sculptures, you can see figures wearing um, a band like that around their head. But I also looked at uh, people's wills from the 1340s and by chance, a vast number of wills from the city of Lyon, which is of course another uh, larger and, um, and an important trade city in France, um, from this period, and I looked to see what, right, for the Christians who, who wrote out their wills, what did they own and what did they do with their property? What does it describe and what did they do with it? And I found the will of a, of a woman who was widowed. Her husband had been a, um, a merchant who manufactured drinking vessels, glass drinking vessels. And in her will, she left her clothes to her mother and some things to her brother and a sleeveless robe that she had, she said should be sold for the, to the poor. But her ring and her headband, she left to her daughter. So this was the kind of object that you might pass from mother to daughter. And that, again, begins to speak to me about what is the place of these kinds of objects in the lives of the people who own them. And when we look at our rings again, uh, and we see some of the rings we saw before, I've added a turquoise and, and, a, and a glass ring in silver. I looked at the will from, 18, uh, from April of 1348, so just as the Black Death is breaking out, who's the wife of a blacksmith in Lyon. What did her treasure consist of? First, she leaves clothing and cloth to the local hospital, and then other cl clothes to a poor woman a prayer book with silver fasteners to her niece. And then to someone called Anne, she leaves three among her best gold rings, three of her best gold rings, and the very best gold ring, so presumably a fourth, to someone called Jeanette. So she's, signal she's pointing out four gold rings that she has, but those aren't all her rings. We're just not getting the descriptions of the rest. So we know that it's normal for somebody in the merchant class to have half a dozen or more gold rings. And we realize then when we look at what's in the Colmar treasure, which has 13 rings, some of which are silver, some of which are gold, that those numbers are a normal kind of accumulation for a family of the merchant class. So what happens when there is no will? What happens if unexpected disaster befalls the owner and that person doesn't come home to what's 
hidden in the mattress, tucked in the wine cellar, under the bed, in the wall, all those places that we today might hide things when we're going away for a weekend, we didn't get to the bank, all of those places were used as hiding places in the medieval period. We read about them. They hid them in the loo, they hid them in the wine barrels. What happens if those people don't come home? Isn't what they owned, isn't what they held dear automatically more precious to us, shouldn't it be? Now let's look at this object. This is a small silver, like a size of a stick pin. You might overlook it all together. But if I tell you that that's a silver writing pen and that it goes with an object, it's, it's the kind of object that you see on the left. This is the only one that survives with its whole ensemble. It was a writing pen that you would use with ivory tablets and you would put wax in the, writing ta in the ivory tablets and then you could write messages in the tablets and then you can scrape away the wax. So it's text messaging in the 14th century. And then there's a little leather pouch that you put the whole thing in. Well, the only thing we have from the Colmar treasure is that little pen, that little silver pen. But doesn't that tell us much more about these people's lives than the 28,000 coins from Salzburg that were found in the street? Doesn't it tell us more about their dreams, about their secret longings? And isn't it more poignant to their story? And doesn't this simple gold ring, right? This is a simple, not very heavyweight gold band with a crescent moon and a star. And that was an emblem used not only on this ring, but on other pieces that, uh, um, uh, help me Esther, uh, uh, seals of uh, Jewish people that we know from the medieval period. They used it as their personal seal. Why? Because it was emblematic of the month of Nisan. And you see on the right a page from the uh, Bamberg, Bamberg Mazar of 1279, so contemporary with these pieces from the Homar treasure, um, which range in date from 1270 to 13, just the eve of the Black Death in 1348. And you see that that emblem is used there for the opening of the prayers for the month of Nisan. So why do they use that? Because it's about redemption. It's about hopefulness. These are people who are setting down roots and, and looking forward to their future. Doesn't that say much more than that diamond ring from the Titanic? What's the diamond ring from the Titanic tell us, except that someone rich died there? This to me is, is so much more precious. And this most humble object, which is a gilded copper fitting. I couldn't even see the gilding until I held this thing in my hand. Again, this is something, I'm amazed that the workmen didn't throw this away. What is it? It's a part of a box, a box like this one at the cloisters. This is the kind of precious box that you would put your jewelry in. Now, this is contemporary with our treasure. Do not be deceived by the motifs the swastika motifs in the wood inlay. In the 14th century and up until 1930, that motif is about good luck, about good fortune. It's only perverted in our 20th century era. This is a box, the kind of place where you would put precious rings. All we have left from this treasure is that hinge or lock piece on the right hand side. Maybe the box disintegrated over the 600 years that the treasure was lost. Maybe it had fallen apart and the workmen threw it out. We don't know. But doesn't that tell you something about the lives that these people were leading and were their hopes and dreams for their futures? In the exhibition, we included this view of Komar from 1575. So 150 years after the Jews of Komar have been extinguished. It shows a pretty little village with eight churches. There is no hint in this image that there had ever been Jews a part of this community. They've disappeared. And it's particularly weird in this case because Sebastian Munster was actually a professor of Hebrew language. He was interested in history of the Jewish people. But there's no Jew to be seen here. Without the Komar treasure, the medieval Jewish community 
doesn't exist. And so our job in bringing the Colmar treasure to the cloisters is to put them back where they belong, put them back in the center of the town, of their city, where they had lived for the better part of a century in good circumstances. We thought, as we were organizing this treasure, that this was the only heritage that we have of the Jews of Komar. And to my utter delight, I came to know just before this book was published, the amazing woman, Judith Kogel, who found, who has found in the end papers of books, printed books from the library in Komar, remnants of the library of the Jewish residents of Komar. And she, her scholarship is something amazing. And she has pieced them together and come to realize what kinds of books they had, how many books they had, both scholarly books, ritual books, decorated books like this one with this amazing bird on it. Um, and so we realized that we actually have another part of their heritage that survives. And so amazingly enough, in January, before our exhibition opened in July, I was in Colmar, I went to the library just to see this book. I had no money in my budget to borrow this and no hope that anybody six months before a show opened would say, oh, but don't you want to borrow it? Which is exactly what they said to me. And I said, of course I want to borrow it. I have no money for it. Let me go home and see what I can do. And I spent whatever political capital I had with the director's office and said, we must have this book. I think I can get it to Paris. And I think from Strasbourg on the train, and I think the people in Colmar will allow us to have it come without a personal representative. I think they'll allow the curators in Cluny to take it. That will save us some money. Please, please, please let it come to New York. And it did. And that was for me, a very special thing. And then um, Judith herself came to give a lecture at the Cloisters. And I felt somehow that, um, that the story that I thought was a closed chapter uh, was now a chapter that was reopened. And um, that, that the story about this community uh, really is one that goes on. And um, that makes me very happy. Um, so that is all I have to share with you, and I, uh, I hope you'll share my sense of the importance and why this really is a treasure, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, what a fascinating presentation. And before I begin with this section, um, let me mention for anybody who has not participated in our Sunday sessions before that this is the time where you have an opportunity to ask your questions of our speaker. And you may submit any questions you have through the chat or Q&A function. Um, I will see it at the bottom of the screen and then I'm delighted to pass it on um, to Barbara. So let me begin first by thanking Esther, um, who truly brought the story of the Komar treasure to light for the group from Fifth Avenue Synagogue that traveled to the cloisters in December. Um, you were a wonderful guide, and I hope that many of our, our group are on tonight. Um, I also want to thank Barbara, of course, first for bringing this exhibit into the public eye um, in New York and in the United States for elevating not only the special pieces that make up this wonderful exhibit, but for elevating the memory of the Jews of Colmar. Um, I, I particularly felt that when I, I saw the shocking map that erases the community. So I, I think it's a very, very important thing to do. Um, and of course, we thank you for your wonderful presentation tonight, which I will label a treasure. <laughs> so, um, with that, I do have a few questions and then we already have, I see one from the audience. Um, the first one that I, I will share from one of our participants, a comment. So really, we can judge nothing at face value. The story is what makes things treasures. It's just like life. It's not the places we go, but the journey we have while at any destination. Maybe you'd like to comment a little bit on that. Oh, that's a, that's a lovely observation. Um, yes, 
and <laughs> I, I wouldn't count the biscuit from the Titanic, <laughs> right? Uh, as an art historian, uh, and actually in a class that I taught, uh, I, I, I was privileged to teach uh, a, a seminar session for um, Philippe de Montebello's class at the Institute of Fine Arts. That was the, one of the last things I did before uh, disappearing with, uh, with everyone else uh, into quarantine. Uh, and I said to the students, you know, there's a difference between art and material culture. And it's important for us as art historians to see, the, to see that difference. You know, that said, um, what your, what your uh, question, your, what the comment says is absolutely true. And I think that for me, um, it is absolutely those journeys, whether those are those um, physical journeys that we used to love to make, right? My journey to Colmar, which has all kinds of uh, resonance for me with the people I talked to, with the people I met, um, but also really the, the kind of uh, intellectual and ultimately spiritual journey that working on this material um, gave to me. I, um, the, the resonance for me of thinking about, about individuals' lives and, and the tragedy of individual loss and the, the preciousness of, uh, of things that may or may not have value, but are Im imbued with value because of what they meant in a family or what they meant in a community. Uh, and that was brought home to me very much too um, by a woman who came up to me during the show who was herself a, a Holocaust survivor who, who told me about going back to her home in Antwerp where she knew her family had secreted some things before they were deported and finding them and getting them back again and, and how she, she wept when she told me the story because this treasure, seeing this treasure made her think of that. So, so every aspect of one's journey, whether wherever it takes you, I think can, um, can, can build up a kind of treasury in, inside you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I agreed with your comment um, in your presentation that this exhibit was important to the cloisters um, in its place as a Jewish exhibit, so to speak. And I was wondering if the cloisters had ever really had a Jewish exhibit before. No, nothing. Um, that's not quite fair, right? We, we, ha we have not had any special, this is the first special exhibit. Um, how we classify things at the Met is kind of funny. Like if, if I have one or two objects on loan from the Jewish Theological Seminary, which I have had, and which are very special to us and which uh, do draw visitors, that's not a special exhibition, right? That's not a special exhibition. It's not on the exhibition calendar. But those are installations of things that um, have, can have great significance. And so we have had that, uh, especially because of the uh, generous spirit of our um, colleagues at the at JTS. Um, I've also, I had also at one point borrowed two uh, single leaves from Hebrew manuscripts. Um, it's a funny thing, Christian medieval manuscripts often survive as single leaves uh, and it has to do with history of how, how books were preserved. Um, but very, very rarely Hebrew, Hebrew texts, illuminated Hebrew texts either survive as a whole book or they don't survive at all every once in a while you get some single leaves and I had borrowed some single leaves from a private collection to show. Uh, Esther may remember others, so but mostly JTS and then more recently our own acquisition of this wonderful Hebrew, Hebrew Bible, which I'm proud to say is in the new Making the Med exhibition, which just opened to the public um, yesterday, yesterday, today. Um, so do go see that. But this and is did you find that yeah. Did you find that the audience was a Jewish audience or did the exhibit have appeal to the mainstream visitors who come to the cloisters? No, both. Absolutely both. Um, and that was, uh, that was, that 
was and it does remain very important to me. Uh, I think that's a, a crucial thing um, in our day, especially. Can I add something? Yeah, please. Uh, no, just was since I since I was the one who took around some of these groups, and they were definitely the first time that some of these groups came to the museum, and they really uh, appreciated what you uh, what you had established there. And uh, uh, what I would tell groups is, this is the first time there's a Jewish exhibition, and you know that's very impressive, Barbara. Mm -hmm. I hope it's not the last. I don't believe. No, it. let's keep going. I don't believe it will be the last. Okay. <laughs> Was it difficult to negotiate the loan or the purchase of the exhibit from, I, I, I wasn't sure if the, if the Quizzers now owns it or if it was on loan. Oh. But you mentioned <laughs> yeah, it's loan. just a loan. Um, it belongs to the Musée de Cluny in Paris. And no, it wasn't difficult at all. Um, I, so I have been friends my entire career with a woman who, when, I, when we first became friends, we were both just starting out in our careers and she ultimately became the director of the Musée de Cluny. And they were closing for um, renovations. And so she said, is there anything that you would like to borrow? <laughs> and I said, yes, ah. I'd, like borrow, I'd like to borrow the Colmar treasure. And she said, oh, that's your first choice? And I said, yes, that's my first choice, not my last choice. Um, sadly, my last mm -hmm. choice, um, was the Cluny Unicorn Tapestries, which were to have come this fall. And uh, they are a victim, that loan was a victim of the pandemic. We, uh, there was a very narrow window during which we could borrow uh, from Cluny while they're closed for renovation. And the window uh, coincided with the, the consequences of the, of the pandemic. Yeah, I, I did want you a little bit about COVID and the art world and whether you thought there would be um, a long-term effect. Uh, well, there's an immediate effect and how long-term it is, is too soon to say. Um, and let's, let me just answer that in terms of the unicorns who aren't coming. Um, mm -hmm. For the, for the, for the foreseeable future, we are able to accommodate 25% of our usual visitors. Borrowing, uh, borrowing great, some of the world's greatest treasures can only be justified when, when you will, when a public, when a great public will have the chance to see them. And I couldn't bear, it just, it would have been irresponsible curatorially to bring these unparalleled masterpieces across the ocean. Anytime you move a work of art, even from one gallery to another, there's some level of risk. I couldn't bear to bring them knowing that only 25% of the people who would want to see them would be able to see them. And when the museum would incur the expense that is involved, there's, you know, when we borrow from sister institution, there's no fee for us, but the expense of proper packing and shipping of priceless works of art is very, very high. I, we just, we couldn't do it, just couldn't do it. So that's not gonna be that way forever. Right, and, um, and so uh, our, our exhibitions in, for, for a moment may, may, be in a quiet, may be somewhat quieter, but I hope that, you know, this was a quiet exhibition in a way, but I think it had a big impact. So I, I'm hopeful that we can still have that. And eventually yeah. we'll get back to um, business as usual, I hope. Yes, we all hope. I'm going to share one more comment that's come from the audience, which was um, a tribute to, to, your, to the structure of tonight. It said, you set up the story perfectly by analyzing what is a treasure. That made the presentation much more interesting. Thank you. Oh, so I wanted to share that. Um, and now I'm going to ask um, Sheila if she would unmute our esteemed cantor, Joseph Malavani. He has some questions he wanted to ask you also.
So that's okay now? Can you hear me? I can. Okay. Uh, Dr. Bem, big congratulations to you for an outstanding uh, presentation. And uh, with my wife sitting next to me, who is an artist, and she all the time roams into my ears an interpretation to what you have been saying all the time. <laughs> <laughs> that, that enriched me, at least, very, very much. And I wanted to thank you, of course, obviously, for Esther uh, Goldman. They, are, they listen to my lectures that I've been giving also through the uh, Zoom. Wow. Yes, I'm, I am very familiar with Colmar. Um, some years ago, when I gave a concert in um, Strasbourg, uh, the, uh, some people from Colmar, some Jewish people from Colmar, and the, yes, as you, I'm sure you know, there is a community, a yes. Jewish community there. Yes. Uh, they, they came to Strasbourg to, to the concert that I gave there in that big shul. I don't remember the name of it, the big synagogue. And so I'm very much, and they wanted me to come there, but I didn't get a chance. I didn't have time. I promised them another time, but whatever, it's right. I wanted to ask you, uh, first of all, uh, Col uh, Colmar, as you may know, although it, do it doesn't go directly with, um, with art or arts uh, collection collectors, uh, Colmar has special, their own minhagim, their own, uh, um, they have their own uh, set of values. Not values, they have, they, what, the way we pray, they pray a little different. They have customs, different customs, and it, it especially Colmar. And so I was fascinated when I met with them and we sat after the concert and we chatted a little bit. But I wanted to ask you, in a, right the first uh, object that you presented uh, were the gold coins. Yeah. And yes, we know about the gold coins uh, that were just found in Israel, obviously. The question that I have to you is the following. People see gold and they just look at it as gold and they look at the value of gold. Mm -hmm. People who think a little more would look at the, at the coins and say, oh, well, it's coins. I, I, I a little, uh, forgive me for saying it, I expected uh, to hear from you a description of what gold, what coins they were right. that, you, that you presented. What uh, the value perhaps at that time, the market value at that time, forget about the gold. Was there or was there not any message? Did they have any uh, faces of kings or queens or whatever it or is? Emblems. And, or emblems. And I, I, um, I, I immediately wrote a note to myself that <laughs> this is what I wanted to ask you. Um, the, I would appreciate if you could elaborate a little bit. Great. Yes, thank you. Um, you know, I, uh, I could have spoken for another hour. and I, I, <laughs> <laughs> So there were a few things that I, I left out. So forgive me for leaving out those things. Um, and, and thank you for, uh, for raising them. First of all, um, the importance of the there is an important community in Colmar now, and I'm thank you for, for raising that. And there's a, a, a rather fine synagogue there. Uh, cool. It is where I think the chief rabbi for Alsace is uh, physically located in Colmar. So, um, so that's one thing. Um, the second thing about the gold coins, the, I have a theory about the one gold coin that is in that treasure. First of all, it's a gold florin, right? So that was the, sort of a pen, yes. pinnacle yeah. gold coin. Uh, and it has, uh, it, and it was minted in Hungary, or pre what is present day Hungary, as part of the whole Holy Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can't remember which year it is. Um, but I'll just put in a little plug for the catalog. The catalog is still available, and it will tell you exactly. And I think it's 1347. But what is it about that particular coin that I think matters? In, um, I'm going from memory here. I'm going to say it's something like 1342. The Holy Roman Emperor says, okay, all you Jewish communities in my imperial lands, I'm here to protect you. But in exchange for that, any, any one of you 
who has an income over a certain level must every year pay me a tax. And that tax was one gold florin. Mm -hmm. It was like mafia protection money, right? Yeah, sounds <laughs> like it, yes. And it's, it's, I can't prove it, but remember there's 313 silver coins in that hoard and one gold coin. And I think it's possible that that one gold florin was the tax that that family was going to pay to the emperor when it came due, and it came due in October every year, right? We know that the community ceased to exist somewhere between January and May. So I could be wrong, but the presence of a single gold coin seemed to me to resonate with that aspect of the story too. And, the, and then of course the incredible irony that there's one gold coin sitting there as the protection money and it was useless, right? It, it, it served no purpose. So that's just one thought about it. Yeah, uh, by the way, I want to tell you that uh, our granddaughter uh, is starting a second year um, at Columbia in the art department. And I think, I'm, I think I'm going to send her to, to, to visit with you. I would love that. Yeah, she's a lovely girl. Her Someday name's... when I'm not sitting still in my office in Montclair, New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much for thank the explanation. So thank you. Thank you very much, Barbara. So um, with that, let me turn it back over to the rabbi to close, but we thank you again for a wonderful presentation. Um, they really hit the intersection of art and religion and history in, in such a fascinating way. So thank it's you very my, much. My pleasure to be with you. Yes, I wanted to echo uh, Rachel's uh, comments and to thank uh, Dr. Bain for a truly fascinating uh, presentation and for Esther for helping to arrange and coordinate and for introducing. I just wanted to conclude with a one final question for you, uh, Barbara. Yes. Um, that you, you began your presentation with um, a, a beautiful story of the impact, the setting of the, the museum could have on the individual, the garden, and how it was a sanctuary, and how uh, it touched the actual structure and design of the museum, uh, touched someone on a very personal level. I was just curious from your work at the museum, specifically with this exhibit, and I'm sure many people, individuals and groups have seen it, um, on the way out, after they've gone through the exhibit with the tour, um, what um, insights or personal reflections or how has it touched people personally after you know, seeing the exhibit um, on the way out? Like what, uh, what um, lessons of life or whatever, you know, in what way has it uh, impacted people's lives from your experience of guiding people or uh, curating the exhibit. So do you mean specifically with regard to this exhibition or more generally with the cloisters? Uh, specifically this exhibition. Um, I, I think that it surprises people. Um, to know, and I think this is so important, that medieval Europe was a complex society with people from different backgrounds living next door to each other, um, sometimes in circumstances that were favorable, and, and uh, unfortunately, I, I spoke much less about the favorable circumstances tonight, um, but, but we know that those also existed in this place, um, and sometimes in circumstances that were terribly fraught. And uh, I think the Cloisters offers people that chance to, find, to sense a, a kind of physical sanctuary um, and that that sanctuary should transcend uh, parochial understandings and um, I think in our day uh, which is certainly one that's very fraught um, the, the kind of co works of art that can speak to common humanity uh, and common, shared, I don't mean common in the lowest sense, I mean in the sense of shared lives, right? That I could look at a 
at the will written by a Christian woman in Lyon and realized that what she had in her hand and what mattered to her was very similar to a Jewish neighbor in Colmar, um, in neighboring Colmar, not really neighboring, uh, in another similar city. Um, I think that's so, it, it's so obvious, but it's so important. And I, and I think we, uh, we lose sight of that at our peril. Okay, thank you so much once again um, for, for, this, for your time this evening. And thank you, Esther, uh, for introducing. And thank you, everyone, all our participants for joining us. We hope everyone is well. We miss everyone. Um, we're preparing for the high holidays. If you haven't uh, uh, yet uh, got the notification, uh, you know, please inform us what your plans are so we can cater to everyone's needs. And uh, we wish everyone a wonderful week, a safe week, and we hope to uh, see you next week. Okay, have a wonderful evening, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks for having me. Thank you.